uh, to the podium. Uh, Dr. Carlin is performing the duties of the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, and she will be here to brief you on the Global Posture Review, which has just been recently uh, completed. Uh, I know you've gotten some background on that uh, already, but uh, Dr. Carlin will be here to, to uh, take additional questions and give you some context. So I'm going to turn over the, uh, the podium to her in, in a minute. Uh, she'll have a brief opening statement. Then I'll be moderating the Q&A as we've done before. Please identify yourself and your outlet before you ask your question. And if you could limit the follow-ups, that would be helpful so we can get as many questions into her uh, as possible. And then when and Dr. Carlin is uh, complete, and uh, and we've run through our Q and A on the on the Global Posture Review. I'll come back up to the podium. I have uh, a few other announcements to make, and uh, and can deal with the news of the day and other issues uh, for the remainder of the time that we're together. So with that, Dr. Carlin. All right. Thanks very much, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'd like to announce that we have concluded the Global Posture Review, or GPR. I'll provide some background on how we conducted the review and highlight some of its key outcomes. On February 4th, 2021, President Biden announced that Secretary Austin will lead the Global Posture Review to align our overseas military posture with his national security guidance. Following several months of analysis and close coordination across the U.S. government, President Biden recently approved Secretary Austin's findings and recommendations resulting from the Global Posture Review. It was a robust interagency effort. The Department of Defense led the GPR with participation and guidance from the National Security Council, the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Additionally, the Department conducted Global Posture Review consultations with our NATO allies, Australia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, and over a dozen partners across the Middle East and Africa to ensure we were bringing the full spectrum of views to the table. The conclusion of the Global Posture Review comes at a key inflection point as the Department increases our focus on China, reinforces our enduring commitments to NATO and European security, conducts analysis regarding requirements in the Middle East following the end of U.S. force presence in Afghanistan, and refines our strategic approach through the national defense strategy. Let me underscore that this Global Posture Review will inform our approach to the national defense strategy. The Global Posture Review was guided by the President's Interim National Security Strategic Guidance released earlier this year. That guidance asserts that the United States will lead with diplomacy first, revitalize our unmatched network of allies and partners, and make smart and disciplined choices regarding our national defense and responsible use of our military. Nested within this guidance, the Global Posture Review assessed DOD's overseas forces and footprint, along with the framework and processes that govern our posture decision making. Based on these assessments, the GPR developed near-term posture adjustments and established guidance for ongoing and future posture planning. It also strengthened DOD's decision-making processes by deliberately connecting global posture planning and decisions to strategic priorities, trade-offs across geographic regions, force readiness, modernization, interagency coordination, and ally and partner consultations. The results of the Global Posture Review will serve as a disciplining framework for the Department to match our posture to our strategy, with benefits accruing for years to come. I'd now like to highlight a few Global Posture Review outcomes by region. I'll note that, of course, many of the Global Posture Review outcomes remain classified for operations security reasons and to preserve the confidentiality of our consultations with allies and partners. Consistent with the Secretary's focus on China as our pacing challenge, the priority region for the Global Posture Review was the Indo-Pacific. The Global Posture Review directs additional cooperation with allies and partners across the region to advance initiatives that contribute to regional stability and deter potential military aggression from China and threats from North Korea. These initiatives include seeking greater regional access for military partnership activities, enhancing infrastructure in Australia and the Pacific Islands, and planning rotational aircraft deployments in Australia, which Secretary Austin announced at the Australia-U.S. Ministerial in September. 
The Global Posture Review also facilitated Secretary Austin's approval of the permanent stationing of a previously rotational attack helicopter squadron and artillery division headquarters in the Republic of Korea, which the department announced earlier this year. Turning to Europe, the Global Posture Review strengthens the combat credible deterrent against Russian aggression in Europe and enables NATO forces to operate more effectively. Based on an initial Global Posture Review assessment and a recommendation from Secretary Austin, in February 2021, President Biden rescinded the 25,000 active duty force cap in Germany that was established by the previous administration. Also based on early Global Posture Review assessments, in April 2021, Secretary, announced in, Secretary Austin announced in Berlin that DOD would permanently station an Army multi-domain task force and a theater fires command, a total of 500 Army personnel in Germany. In August, the department shared with Belgium and Germany that we will retain seven military sites previously designated for return to host nations under the European Infrastructure Consolidation Plan. Finally, the Global Posture Review identified additional capabilities that will enhance U.S. deterrence posture in Europe, which we will discuss with allies in the near future. Turning to the Middle East, the Global Posture Review assessed our evolving counterterrorism requirements following the end of DOD operations in Afghanistan and our approach toward Iran. In Iraq and Syria, the Global Posture Review directs that DOD posture will continue to support the Defeat ISIS campaign and building the capacity of our partner forces. Looking ahead, the Global Posture Review directs the Department to conduct an additional analysis on enduring posture requirements in the Middle East. As Secretary Austin noted at the Manama Dialogue, we have global responsibilities and must ensure the readiness and modernization of our forces. These considerations require us to make continuous changes to our Middle East posture, but we always have the capability to rapidly deploy forces to the region based on the threat environment. In Africa, analysis from the Global Posture Review is supporting several ongoing interagency reviews to ensure the Department of Defense has an appropriately scoped posture to monitor threats from regional violent extremist organizations to support our diplomatic activities and to enable our allies and our partners. In Central and South America and the Caribbean, the Global Posture Review reviewed the role of DOD posture in support of national security objectives, including humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, and counter-narcotics missions. The Global Posture Review directs that DOD posture continue to support U.S. government efforts on the range of transnational challenges and partnerships in the region. Finally, the Global Posture Review provided foundational information for the National Defense Strategy, which will shape how this administration connects our overseas posture to the Department's overall strategic approach. Moving forward, the Secretary is confident that the Global Posture Review sets the Department on the right path toward greater strategic alignment in support of the President's national priorities. Thank you very much. With that, I'll take a few questions. Bob Good. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Bob Burns, Hi. maybe. Hi. Um, on Australia, um, you mentioned, I think, uh, infrastructure improvements and an increased uh, rotational aircraft rotational uh, deployments. Could you put a little fl uh, flesh on the bone there with um, what kind of infrastructure are you talking about and how big an aircraft um, rotational units are you talking about? Great. Thanks so much for that question, Bob. Uh, in Australia, you'll see new rotational fighter and bomber aircraft deployments. You'll see ground forces training and logis increased logistics cooperation. And actually, more broadly across the Indo-Pacific, you'll see a range of infrastructure improvements in Guam, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, and, and Australia. Those will include things more broadly like logistics facilities, fuel storage, munition storage, airfield upgrades. Um, uh, so we're doing a lot uh, that will hopefully come to fruition in the coming years. Thank you. Jane, go ahead. Thank you. Um, has the United States any change of uh, nuclear umbrella uh, to South Korea against uh, North Korean uh, nuclear attack? Our extended deterrence uh, with our closest allies is critical, and I do not have anything to announce on changes regarding it. Currently, not changed yet. The only because of uh, there is a rumor that uh, 
United States only cares North Korea attacked to their land, I mean, your own land, the U.S. land, and then they're concerned about that kind of, not concerned about the other land. Is that true? Uh, I, I, um, Look, I would say the secretary is headed to South Korea, as you no doubt know, tomorrow, and I think is looking forward to a productive set of discussions. Uh, in terms of changes to um, our extended deterrence, I don't see any reason uh, for any change on, on that front as well. On North Korea, of course, we continue to remain concerned uh, about its problematic and irresponsible behavior. I expect that that will be a robust topic of dialogue uh, for the secretary while he's in Seoul over the coming days. Thank you. So, thank you, C.P. Lantom from AFP. Uh, you were speaking about uh, credible deterrent uh, against uh, Russia, but if you don't say anything, if it's completely uh, <laughs> classified, how can you have a deterrence if you don't say what you are doing? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Uh, look, as you know, we've made some important shifts to our posture in Europe, really since 2014, when we saw the Russians uh, invade uh, Crimea. Um, and those changes, as part of the assessment of the Global Posture Review, we found were, were right, that we, were, we had made some really important investments, had deepened our cooperation and collaboration with partner militaries across Europe. Uh, and, and, and so those are, those are worthwhile, and those make sense, and we want to continue those. In fact, as I briefly noted, some of the bigger pieces of the Global Posture Review are the fact that we are not moving 25,000 troops from Germany. Indeed, we are actually increasing troops in Germany, as uh, the Secretary announced in Berlin in April. I think you're also getting, though, at this day-to-day -day challenge that we're currently enmeshed in, where we see some pretty worrisome behavior uh, by President Putin. I don't know that any of us uh, can read his mind. Uh, and know exactly what he's planning, but the president has been very clear about his desire for a stable and predictable relationship with Russia. And I think you've heard from this entire uh, interagency, um, including, of course, the secretary, just our, our profound concern with what uh, appear to be some really unhelpful movements in uh, the European theater. Let's go to the phones. Uh, Idris, I think you're there. Thanks. Um, I, I assume the review is in some sort of report form. How, how many pages is this report? And uh, secondly, um, you mentioned Australia and Guam as specific locations. What, why did you mention those two locations? Is that because that's the biggest thing to come out of the review? Or I'm just confused. Why, why single those two out while not giving details about other countries? Great. Thank you so much, Idris. Uh, look, I think those were notable, which is why I, I cited those specifically. But I would, of course, highlight that we're engaged in consultations with our allies and partners across the Indo-Pacific. And while those were just examples of some posture shifts, you are no doubt tracking that we're also uh, enhancing the, the scope and the scale of our exercise with allies, exercises with allies and partners uh, across the region as well. As you no doubt know, Idris, um, Posture is one piece of how we're thinking about uh, these relationships. Uh, of course, you all will recall when the secretary was out in the Philippines a couple months ago, and we had the, uh, the Visiting Forces Agreement signed, which provides just a plethora of uh, increased cooperation between the um, militaries from the U.S. And, and the Philippines. You all, no doubt, of course, are also tracking the AUKUS deal, which provides all sorts of opportunities in terms of uh, not just deepening our cooperation with close, uh, our close uh, one of our closest allies in the Asia Pacific, but also helping to knit together our European and our uh, our European allies and our Indo-Pacific allies. On your first point, Idris, uh, I'm not sure that it would be terribly productive to get get into the details. I think probably you know in terms of of the length, um, it is not a dissertation. Uh, so hopefully it is sufficiently punchy and pithy that it will be internalized by the department. Um, and I, let me let me pause there if you have any other thoughts on it. Ariana Veras, and um, I work for TPA, African Outlet. So can you give me a little more detail on how the global posture review will be a uh, function in Africa? And is the administration thinking on increasing the funds that they cut from African, African command? 
I'm sorry, I didn't catch the second part of your question. Can you say that one more time? Uh, we know that the previous administration cut some funds in the African Command. And uh, um, I just want more details on how this posture review will be functioning in Africa and if the administration is considering to increase the, the, the funds in, in the African Command. Great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, look, uh, this is not sort of the end-all, be-all on posture around the world. The Global Force Posture Review came in trying to do a baseline and trying to figure out what's where, what is it doing. Uh, I think folks had seen that there were a bunch of announcements throughout 2020 of changes, and the administration wanted an understanding uh, of, of effectively what, what we had, you know, what was placed where and the effect uh, that, it, that it was having, as I noted. Um, but it's a moment in time. And so I expect that there will be follow on work and I expect that that will include Africa and I should note the Middle East as well. Um, so it, it will continue to evolve. Frankly, our posture needs to be tied to our strategy. And so especially I noted that this is going to be a foundation for the national defense strategy. Um, you know, it's, it, it will be important that it, it, uh, it, it informs how we are taking uh, the, these approaches to challenges, uh, whether it's on the continent or challenges uh, around the world. Um, so I think you will find there's more there's more to come. Uh, I should note, though, uh, that the more to come uh, very much includes very close consultations with our allies and partners around the world. We did something like 75 consultations with allies and partners. We wanted to ensure that none of our allies and partners learned about decisions or new ideas, um, frankly, from all of you, uh, as great as your work is. We wanted to ensure that they had had the private conversations with us first. And that is an approach you might recall we pledged when we, pit, when we first announced the Global Posture Review, and I'm really uh, heartened to know that we were able to make that a reality. And so as we kicked it off, we engaged in consultations with allies and partners around the world. As we were going through it, we did the same, and then, of course, now as we've wrapped it up, we, we've, we've done the same. Thanks. Um, could you talk about how the Afghanistan withdrawal factored into the review? And did it free up resources that are being used specifically in other places, such as the Pacific or, or Europe or Africa? Thank you very much for that. So uh, the Afghanistan review was really conducted through sort of a, uh, a separate interagency process, a dedicated interagency process. It was not part of the global uh, global posture review. Now that it is wrapped, uh, of course, it is informing how we're thinking about posture going forward, whether it's how we think about over the horizon posture um, as it relates to the Middle East and South Asia, whether it's how we think about um, the violent extremist organization threat. So I I would say it, it is absolutely informing it, but the Global Posture Review was quite discreet from the Afghanistan uh, decision-making process. I mean, in terms of military resources, obviously, we had resources in Afghanistan. They're not there anymore. You have more resources at your disposal. Can you draw a direct line between the withdrawal and being able to do some of these other initiatives in other areas? Thanks for that. You know, at this time, I'd say we're still doing analysis, looking at it. Um, the, uh, as I briefly mentioned, the Global Posture Review is uh, prescribing some further analysis, um, both on the Middle East and Africa. And I think that that um, the Afghanistan withdrawal is is an important piece of that. As we as we try to understand exactly this great point that you're getting at, you know, what what are um, are there assets and platforms freed up? Are there different approaches? How do we how do we think about that? And obviously that. That's um, some, somewhat fundamental, uh, given just how long uh, our presence was there. Rio, I'll go to you and then to the phone. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Rio Nakamura with Japan's Nikkei Asia. Uh, I want to ask you about Taiwan. Uh, are there any initiatives coming out of the GPL that will require coordination and engagement with Taiwan moving forward? I don't have anything to announce at this time on that front. Okay, let me go to the phones. Uh, Sangman, Radio Free Asia. Uh, yes, thank you for uh, taking my question. I have a question about the threat from North Korea. Uh, so in GPR, do you have any specific uh, field you GPR focus on in terms of dealing with the North Korean threat? In relate to that, do uh, in GPR, do you considering to resumption of large scale uh, joint military exercise between US and South Korea to enhance exercise? 
I'm sorry, I didn't catch the very last sentence. Large scale, was it exercises you were saying or? Large scale exercise between US and South Korea in terms of enhancing exercise in GPR in, in the Pacific area. All right, thank you for that. Uh, so uh, look, on the North Korea threat, obviously we remain profoundly concerned as, as we go through our national defense strategy review, um, you can imagine that our understanding of that threat uh, is, is that, that's playing into it, I should note. Um, Right now, we're in the throes of our national defense strategy review, our nuclear posture review, and our missile defense review. So reviews abound around the department at this moment. Uh, we remain profoundly concerned on, on that front. Um, I think we see that our posture in South Korea is robust and it is effective. And so uh, I have no, no changes that, that we would want to uh, announce at this time on, on that front. It is, uh, it's a, it's a smart, smart posture. Uh, in terms of uh, exercises, um, the Global Posture Review did not look at the issue of large-scale global exercises vis-a-vis uh, -vis South Korea. Back to the phones again. Uh, Heather from USNI. Thanks. Um, I know you mentioned AUKUS a little bit, but I was wondering if you could expand on how AUKUS um, may inform or may have informed the Posture Review or how it will play out in the Posture Review much for that. Um, you know, AUKUS uh, is a great case study, I think, of just how um, robust and meaningful we can really make our alliances. Uh, and, and so the, um, you know, one of the challenges is some, sometimes one might see a big uh, initiative like the rollout of the Global Posture Review as the end-all, be-all. As I briefly noted, it should not be. And in fact, one should look holistically at all the things that we are doing um, to deal with the evolving security environment. Uh, the Secretary has been pretty clear that China is the pacing challenge, and there's a whole bunch of energy around the department to realize his direction on that front. And I would say uh, the AUKUS Trilateral Enhanced Security uh, uh, partnership, uh, I think, will enable all sorts of different types of cooperation, whether it's through exercises or technology sharing. Um, I think we've, we've got uh, no, no shortage of opportunities on that front. And as we push forward on our various reviews, I think um, this will become a real case study, both for opportunity and also to study for other relationships. Caitlin. Hi. Um, yes. So I am wondering, you mentioned that there would be improvements made in the Pacific to established bases, but I'm wondering if you are, uh, if the, there's any new projects that might be in place, new military facilities, Palau, for instance, last year offered the U.S. to host. And then to Travis's point, um, you talk about there being new and impro or, sorry, improvements and a shift towards the Pacific, but are there any areas that we're shifting away from to um, get those resources to send them towards the Pacific? Great, thank you for that. Um, other than what I announced in my opening remarks, I wouldn't, I wouldn't add anything in terms of new changes. In terms of some of the shifts, uh, the one example I might uh, offer up is um, in the Middle East. What we saw is the secretary made some made a decision a couple months ago to redeploy some air and missile defense assets uh, from the region. These assets were on a heel-to-toe rotation, and frankly, they um, were beginning to suffer from some real readiness challenges. You know, one of the things we're trying to do with this global uh, posture view, uh, as, as I briefly noted, is this disciplining framework. So maybe I'll spend a quick moment on this disciplining framework. You know, the idea is to help the department look at various proposals and think also about what effect do these have on readiness? What effect do they have on our efforts to modernize the force? So. To take just a, a hypothetical, um, part of what the GPR will do is when a commander comes forward and says, I'd like uh, to set up new posture in X place or Y place, what we'll now be able to do uh, in a really kind of rigorous and thoughtful way is to try to think through, uh, based on the guidance and analysis from the Global Posture Review, what impact would this posture have for our warfighting capabilities? Um, how might the host nation be amenable or not amenable to such a change? Um, what are the resource trade-offs? And that's looking across um, geography, of course, because we happen to have you know all sorts of competing demands. Um, and really, uh, kind of, and, and of course, do we have the sufficient agreements in place to it to um, to enable the change as well? So what what it's going 
going to allow is, uh, frankly, for all of us to staff the secretary in a more thoughtful and rigorous way so that as he looks at various proposals or recommendations, he's really able to look across all of the opportunity costs and gains, if you will, uh, and then make a, a profoundly informed decision. Hello, Dr. Klein. Hello. Um, uh, two things. The, uh, on the enduring kind of reviews, it, apparently the GPR directs additional analysis regarding enduring posture requirements in the Middle East. Who specifically has to carry that out? Like, is that directed at one person to do, and is there a timeline? Can you give us any specifics when we might actually hear some kind of anything on that? And then I have one follow-up. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, it does absolutely direct more work uh, on the on the Middle East in an effort to um, think through how that security environment is shifting and how and in what ways our posture does or does not support it. Obviously, we are deeply cognizant of this department's responsibility to defend our vital national security interests as they relate to the region, which, as you know, we have a very robust presence in the Middle East right now, tens of thousands of troops, bases scattered all, all over the place. Um, and so the plan is, uh, now that the Global Posture Review is complete, there will be an effort over the coming months to try to do deeper analysis uh, and really, really push through and see um, what more needs to be done. Um, are there assets or platforms that are facing, say, readiness challenges, like the ones I had mentioned? Um, are there other capabilities that might make more sense or less sense in the region? Uh, I can't really give you a timeline other than saying the, the coming months. Is and. It, you're, is there one person who's sort of been directed to do that? Or is it is it you or is it, I mean, who's doing it? Uh, that That's a wonderful question. Uh, this, I suspect, will be a, I shouldn't say I suspect, I, this will be a collaborative uh, effort with the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Staff. And we'll, we'll be able to um, help the Secretary see kind of some good analysis on how to think through uh, the options on, on the region. And then just one follow-up on Caitlin's. You mentioned the, the, um, the decrease in the Middle East, but what about, there's been some rumors all along while this has been going on that there might be some cuts in Africa, there might be some in South <laughs> Um, are there any others that we should be looking at in other locations? Even if you can't give us specifics of what the units or people or anything like that, is that accurate that, that there will be cuts in some other places? I don't think you'll see that right now. Uh, what I expect the Global Posture Review to do, this disciplining framework, is that over the next, so say, two, three years or so, as the secretary is given uh, possible decisions on where to plus up or where to cut, this framework will enable him to really do that in a thoughtful and rigorous way. So in, in some ways, um, I think the answer to your question is that uh, the, the, the posture changes may, in some, may, may end up being a little bit of a lagging indicator as our strategy somewhat shifts. John, may I follow that up? Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Uh, both to Courtney and, and to Caitlin's question. At the very beginning, you said there were geographical trade-offs. In other words, that suggests to me that the trade-offs have been made. Yet what Courtney has asked is, can you tell us about some of those? And you, you demurred on that response. Could you please uh, give us some examples of the ones that are already made and not the ones that may be made two or three years down the road, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think I, I gave you a pretty decent case study in the example of the um, the air missile defense assets from the Middle East. That happened earlier this year, Miss, and, uh, and I appreciate what the review suggests of the of the trade offs that you alluded to in the beginning of your remarks. Thanks. So, as you've probably heard me say for the last thirty minutes or so, the Global Posture Review has, in many ways, had at key strategic moments, pieces of it have come out, right? So we had the announcement that we weren't going to withdraw 25,000 folks from Germany. You had the secretary in April, the Osman in September. And so some notable pieces, of course, the air and missile defense assets in the Middle East over the summer. So you've had pieces of this actually already happen. Um, and really now this is kind of drawing the chalk line for this moment on global posture. Hi, Carl Samir with Anadolu Agency. Uh, doctor, based on your analysis, do you think that the U.S. military is still capable to fight two major conflicts in two different separate um, theaters? It, it has, has there been any references to that doctrine in the Global Posture Review? The Global Posture Review did not look at that issue. And, and your thought, like, about is the U.S. military still capable to fight two major wars as you are making changes? 
The, we're in the throes of the National Defense Strategy Review. As I noted, as you know, of course, the force planning construct is always a fundamental piece of a National Defense Strategy Review. What I would say right now is we still have the most capable military in the entire world. Uh, and, and given that, uh, I, you know, I expect that as we pull together the strategy review, as the budget gets pulled together um, over the coming months, there will be some real effort to ensure that should the president want options on the various threats that keep us all up at night, uh, this department will be able to meaningfully hand him uh, realistic options. Got time for a couple more. I go back to the phones. Uh, Jared? Hi, Dr. Carlin. Thank you for doing this. Um, did Des Defense Secretary Austin have the chance to discuss the results of the Global Posture Review with Arab and Gulf allies in Manama? Uh, and if so, can you comment on uh, their response? Was it positive? Um, and can we expect a shift from the conventional overmatch approach in the Gulf uh, in the near future, or are more consultations with regional allies needed for that? Thank you very much. Uh, the secretary had a very productive trip to the Gulf about two weeks or so. Uh, if you have not had an opportunity to read his Manama dialogue speech, I strongly recommend that you do. Uh, and as you can imagine, while I won't get into specifics of the discussions that he had um, with the various partners in the region, um, uh, you know, the role that our military plays in the region was was a, was of course um, a, a topic of discussion. In terms of the uh, question you were talking about of how we're kind of working with our with our partners. You know, one point that the secretary drove home in his Manama speech was how important it is, not just for U.S. capabilities to be in the region, and those are quite robust, of course, uh, but also how important it is to really knit together our partners across the region as well. And that is an area, especially as we look at the various threats in the region, say the, the issue of unmanned, um, uh, uh, unmanned systems, um, that's an area where I think working together uh, uh, our partners and with our capabilities, of course, can really have an out outsized role. Uh, just a couple more. Go ahead, Chris. Christina Anderson, AWPS News. Um, so there's an emerging uh, discussion of, about space access, uh, equity and space access. And I'm wondering if the uh, Global Posture Review, because uh, space access is heavily dependent, of course, on uh, defense and security in space. So that uh, brings up the question of how we're approaching that with our allies and partners, whether we're actively pursuing that. Does the GPR look at that piece? That's my question. Thank, Thank you for that. So the GPR did not look at space or cyber or nuclear. Uh, it just it didn't look at those domains. Um, for various reasons. I would note nuclear, for example, we're in the throes of a nuclear posture review, um, so we didn't really ne need it to do that. Uh, on the space front, however, um, I expect that as we um, complete the national defense strategy, you'll hear, you'll hear more, more in particular on how we're thinking about the space domain. It is absolutely a topic um, with our closest allies and partners, whether it's how we think about um, kind of rules and norms as as it relates to space, or if we see, say, recent case studies of countries maybe engaging in irresponsible behavior in space, how we might think about that and what we might do about it. Good. Uh, Tony Capacity with Bloomberg. A couple things. On the, in the fiscal 23 budget, how will some of this play out? Will we see uh, military construction funds for Guam and Australia, uh, beefed up purchases, possibly of Patriot missiles that you say are having readiness issues in the Middle East and have to be moved? How will some of this be reflected in the budget? And then I had an overall question. Great. Thank you for raising that, because, of course, if our budget doesn't reflect our strategy, we have some real challenges. We are in the throes of building our budget uh, right now, and I would say the Global Posture Review has absolutely informed those conversations. And so I hope that as it comes together uh, and is, is published, you'll be able to point and see some, kind of a, a down payment on some important pieces there. So earlier today, we had a briefing from a senior defense official. The stories that have emerged largely have said no change, no major change in the Pentagon forces in the Pacific. If I'm China, if I'm the PLA's Minister of Propaganda or whatever, and I look at that, what do I take from, were those stories, is that an accurate headline, no major changes at this point, the U.S. forces in the Pacific? Thank you for that. I'd say we have a much more robust understanding of the baseline and a thoughtful, rigorous disciplinary framework to help us get after 
how strategy changes will need to shape posture. I think on the Indo-Pacific, this is uh, kind of a uh, um, we're, turn, we're, we're moving the needle a bit. And what I'd like to think is over the coming years, you will see that needle move more and more. You blew off the, China, the Taiwan question pretty quickly, a uh, perfunctory answer. I need to ask you, though, is that reflected at all in the seeking greater regional access for military partnership activities, beefing up a training presence in Taiwan? That, that is not a piece that I've got to announce today. Fair enough. Okay. Thank okay, you. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, thanks very you. much. Thank you so much. Okay, just a couple of things to uh, start off with. Um, I think, as you know, we announced on Friday, tomorrow morning, Secretary will depart uh, for South Korea to meet uh, his uh, to senior government leaders there, and as well as visit our troops in Korea. Uh, he will meet with the uh, South Korean Minister of Defense, Sa Wook, for the 53rd U.S. Republic of Korea Security Consultative Meeting. And as I said, he'll have a chance to visit with troops on the peninsula. This annual meeting uh, has played a pivotal role in the development of the U.S. ROK alliance. Both sides are expected to pledge to continue to develop the alliance, which we believe uh, is the linchpin of peace and stability on the Korean peninsula and, of course, in Northeast Asia. Uh, in a mutually reinforcing and future-oriented manner. Following the SCM, the Secretary will travel to California. He'll deliver a keynote address at the 2021 Reagan National Defense Forum in Simi Valley. Uh, his speech is going to highlight his vision uh, for uh, the People's Republic of, of China as the department's top pacing challenge, uh, and he'll be able to also discuss in some more detail uh, integrated deterrence, cooperation with allies and partners, the crucial role in, of investments in technology and innovation, and working with uh, industry partners uh, and Congress in the context of the forthcoming national defense strategy, which Dr. Carlin talked about. Um, then I have another uh, short announcement. Uh, the Secretary has directed today a review of the civilian casualty incident that occurred on March 18th, 2019 in Bagus, Syria. This review will be conducted by General Michael Garrett, the commander of U.S. Army Forces Command. He will review the reports of investigation already conducted into that incident and, and will conduct further inquiry into the facts and circumstances related to it. He will have 90 days to complete this inquiry. The inquiry will include an assessment of the following things. The civilian casualties that resulted from the incident, compliance with the law of war, record keeping and reporting procedures, whether mitigation measures identified in previous investigations into the incident were in fact implemented effectively, whether accountability measures would be appropriate, and finally, whether authorities, procedures, or processes should be altered. And again, uh, that report is uh, supposed to be due in 90 days from now. With that, we'll take questions. Bob. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Austin has replied to the Oklahoma governors denying his request that they exempt, be exempt from the vaccine mandate, um, in which he says that uh, if they fail to comply, they would jeopardize their status in the National Guard. I'm wondering what, if you could elaborate on what that means, how that would work, and also, secondly, have you got any other um, requests from other governors for this? There's been no other requests from other governors, no similar concerns expressed by any other governor, uh, uh, similar to that of uh, the Oklahoma governor. Uh, I would point you to the National Guard for more specifics about how they manage these processes, Bob. But in general, um, by not taking the vaccine, therefore not meeting a mandatory readiness requirement, an individual in the National Guard could put at jeopardy their ability to continue to serve in the National Guard. The National Guard, as you know, even under Title 32, is funded by the federal government. So training operations that come under Title 32, much less Title 10, come under the Secretary's purview. So one could elect not to take the vaccine, of course, uh, but then you would be putting at jeopardy your ability to stay in the National Guard, which, as you know, is also a component of the reserve component in the in the total force. But as to the specifics of how that would play out, I'd refer you, in, in this case, specifically to the Oklahoma National Guard to speak to. So in other words, they'd be denied training opportunities? They wouldn't be allowed to, to train. 
They wouldn't be allowed you know, to drill. They wouldn't be allowed to contribute to operations uh, under Title 10 or Title 32. Um, that could lead to potential decertification of their skill sets, whatever that is. Um, uh, and, of course, that would then could lead to no longer being able to serve in the National Guard. Thank you. Yeah, Jenny. Yeah, follow up to uh, Secretary Austin tra travel to the South Korea. Yeah. What will be the main agenda for the, this meeting, I mean, SCCM? There's a lot to talk about. Uh, as you know, this is a yearly, this is an annual, uh, basically a defense ministerial. The Secretary is very much looking forward to it. Um, and uh, there'll be a wide range of things to talk about. I suspect um, they will certainly talk about the continued challenges in the North. Um, and the alliance's posture writ large. I think uh, you can, uh, I would expect them to have discussions about China and the pacing challenge that China uh, continues to pose in the region. Um, I absolutely expect that OPCON, the operational control, uh, will be discussed. And uh, as I said in uh, you know, at the, at the outset, we, uh, we look forward to them uh, uh, being able to, to, um, to reach agreement on um, uh, finding commonality on the final operational capability of, the, uh, of OPCON, um, an assessment of that uh, uh, next year. So there's a lot to talk about. On the OPCON I, would, I would also add, there's also opportunities, uh, and I think the Secretary will take advantage of them, to talk about uh, trilateral cooperation between the United States, Japan, and South Korea as well. Yeah, uh, on the transfer of OPCON to South Korea would be uh, based on conditions. You said that. Uh, when do you expect the full conditions to to be met? Yeah, I, I don't have a date certain to to speak to, uh, Janie. As you know. Uh, OPCON transition remains conditions-based, as you noted, consistent with the bilaterally agreed upon conditions that were articulated in the transition plan itself. Um, so we're committed to continue to work closely with the Republic of Korea to ensure that all those conditions for OPCON are met and that our alliance remains as interoperable and as capable as possible. Any discussions or decisions about OPCON itself uh, will be made inside the, the rubric of the alliance. I don't have anything to announce uh, specifically today. The United States evaluate that the South Korea has the necessary capability to respond to the North Korean nuclear and missile threats. Is there can be a also conditions for the? Well, I, I think the, all the conditions are laid down in the transition plan. I'd point you to that. Um, we've made progress toward OPCON. There's no question about that. But we believe there's more work to do. Thank you. Yeah. Can I, one thing you didn't mention was the declaration of the end of the Korean War. Uh, that's, there's been a lot of Korean press talking about pro progress in that realm in terms of discussions. Uh, a lot of people would care about that. What's the status of that? Is it possible that will be announced this week? Uh, I don't expect an announcement on that, uh, Tony. Uh, we remain committed to achieving peace, of course, on the Korean Peninsula through dialogue and diplomacy with uh, the North. Uh, to this end, I think you're going to see us continue to seek engagement uh, with uh, the DPRK as part of a calibrated practical approach uh, uh, that will try to achieve some sort of tangible progress. But uh, I don't have any announcements on that. To make. So you announced a Syria, 90-day Syria review. What impact did the Pentagon's Inspector General report that was sent up to the Secretary about three weeks ago, it's a controlled unclassified report on, on CENTCOM's handling of the of law of war allegations? Buried in there is their handling, their mishandling of the two with the whistleblower allegations on the Syria strike. What impact did, did that IG report have on his thinking in terms of what? I would tell you there was a lot of inputs that impacted the secretary's uh, decision, but principal among them was uh, his chance to, to take a look at the investigations themselves that were done and a briefing that he got from General McKenzie a couple of weeks ago uh, before the holiday uh, about this particular uh, incident um, and the follow-up actions. Uh, all of that combined to, I think, inform his decision to ask for a further review of it. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Caitlin. Hey, um, can we get the updated vaccine numbers for civilians? The stuff that's on the website is just those who got it at military facilities, and I know mm -hmm. you're not at 50%. I don't have those numbers today, but I think uh, later on this week we'll be able to tabulate something. Why it's not ready yet? We're still we're still assessing, and I just I don't have an update for you. I'm I'm sorry, Tom. Thanks, John. Uh, 
uh, during Dr. Carlin's briefing, she re referred to this quote, uh, referring to Putin, pretty worrisome behavior by President Putin, really unhelpful movement in the European theater. Uh, uh, you were making an unhappy face when she said that. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't recall that. I, 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 I do. Uh, but does that mean you were disagreeing with her comments, or are you mostly aligned? Is she stating sort of an accurate feeling of the Pentagon about Putin? No, there's no, uh, there was no hidden message in there. I certainly didn't mean that at all. I mean, we continue to watch with great concern uh, uh, movements by uh, uh, Russian military units uh, near uh, the Ukraine border, um, we, we and I certainly echo everything that Dr. Carlin said about that. We're watching that closely, and uh, we continue to call on Russia to be more transparent about what they're doing, what their intentions are, what their what what their um, uh, what what units they're placing there, and uh, and and to what end. I obviously can't speak to their. Uh, but, but their intentions, but we continue to believe that any escalatory or aggressive actions would be uh, of great concern, not only to the United States, and our, uh, but, uh, but to our allies and partners there on the European continent. Are we any closer to a call from Secretary Austin to his Russian I don't have any call to announce or speak to today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Rio. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to follow up about the Secretary's trip to South Korea. Uh, recently, the bilateral relationship between Japan and South Korea has been deteriorating again over history and territory. How, how will the Secretary make sure the worsening bilateral relationship will not affect the trilateral security cooperation? Well, look. I mean, we're certainly mindful that the that there has been at times tensions there in, in there in those in the in the bilateral relationships between. Japan and South Korea. And as I mentioned to Jani, one of the things I think you can expect the, the secretary to want to talk about when we get to Seoul uh, tomorrow and, and the rest of the week is opportunities for real trilateral cooperation between the United States, Japan, and South Korea. And it's not like there hasn't been. There have been. Uh, and I think uh, you'll see the Secretary want to continue to pursue discussions about those opportunities going forward. Um, obviously, the bilateral relationship between Japan and South Korea is for those two sovereign nations to speak to and to um, and to articulate and to and to to work on to the degree that they are comfortable working on it. But we see real promise in continued trilateral uh, uh, opportunities, both in training and, and, and operations, whether that's air, maritime, or, uh, or or even ground. And so there's there's lots of things, lots of um, terrific. Uh, uh, soil here that can be plowed, and I think the secretary is looking forward to having uh, an opportunity to explore those kinds of things when we get to Seoul. Sylvie. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, the, the Ukrainian uh, uh, government is uh, uh, saying that now uh, they uh, evaluate at uh, 110,000, more than 110,000 Russian troops at their border. Do you have now a sense of urgency about these movements? Sylvia, I think um, we've been watching with great concern these movements for a while now. Um, and I think we all uh, uh, have a shared understanding of, of, uh, of the importance of what we're seeing um, and concern about the potential. I, I don't want to, again, speak to... Putin's intentions, because as you heard the secretary say, we just don't know what he's up to. Um, but it is of it, it is of continued concern here at, at the Pentagon and across the administration. So again, we're watching this closely. And as for numbers, I wouldn't get into uh, an assessment here from the podium in, in, in terms of what we're seeing exactly. Um, but I can tell you that we continue to see movement. We continue to see additions uh, to their uh, to their uh, forces. And as I described, I think before the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, you know, these are units of a combined nature. I mean, it's it's uh, various different types of units that uh, that continue to collect on or, or not on, but but near the Ukrainian border. And also, um, the um, uh, Belarus uh, government has announced that they are going to have a, a, a joint exercise with Russia. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, nations are free to exercise with uh, their partners as they wish. Um, I, so uh, I'd let the Belarusians talk about whatever training and exercises they in intend to cooperate with Russia on. That's that's for them to speak to. What what we continue to say and, and would add is that 
we don't want to see actions that uh, are unnecessarily aggressive or destabilizing to what is already a very tense situation. Travis. Thanks, John. I wanted to ask you about this new UAP office that was created by Deputy Secretary Hicks and announced last week. Um, the Aerial Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group. Um, was there well any, put. Was there, <laughs> is there, it's a mouthful. Was there any coordination with uh, lawmakers on Capitol Hill that are proposing uh, related legislation like uh, Representative Gallego and Senator Gillibrand? And uh, secondly, some former Pentagon officials who had worked on this issue, uh, Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo, have said that this is an effort for the Pentagon to be less transparent hmm. on UAPs. And I was just wondering if you, if you had any response to that. On, on the first one, um, I, can't, I'm, well, I can't speak to pending legislation. Obviously, I'd refer to those members, but, uh, but we absolutely kept members of Congress informed um, as we... Uh, as we fashioned this this group together and and announced it, um, and it is to your second question, it is really designed to help us better coordinate the reporting processes, um, the actual reports themselves, and the analysis of those reports, so that um, it, rather than uh, getting them sort of piecemeal and ad hoc as we've been getting them from. Uh, from the, from the services, um, th this is a way to coordinate the the input so that we can. Uh, there's a common uh, set of parameters for how to report them and to an analyze them, and, and then to assess what we've got. And not all uh, reports are going to manifest themselves in something that we consider a national security threat. Um, so this is a chance for us to to be a, a much more organized in the way we process these reports. Um, and as we have, we will certainly continue to be uh, as transparent a as we can about uh, these phenomena and, uh, and, and the impact that they may or may not be having uh, on our ability to operate. Is there any specific commitment to release some data or information on these to the public at some point? Something beyond a briefing to Congress or a closed uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a specific report to, to, to announce today that you know, on any kind of a frequent basis that we would do, but I, I can assure you that our intention is to be as transparent about uh, this phenomena as, as we can. Again, Travis, understanding that, um, uh, that, uh, that there will be national security considerations that we have to keep in mind, but we'll be as transparent as we can. But not, I don't want to leave you with the impression that there'll be sort of a, a regular drumbeat of, uh, you know, of, of some kind of report that uh, that gets posted on the website, you know, every couple months. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to the uh, the Syria strike investigation, um, with the Kabul strike, you had a one star look at that, um, and you know, you, you could say that he's looking at decisions that, you know, people with more stars on his shoulders made. And you might wonder if, if he blinked on that. So Garrett is a four star who's going to be looking at the Syria strike. Right. What is the what's the distinction here? Why was there a difference in between these two investigations? Can you speak to the decisions on why Garrett was chosen for this? On the Kabul strike, I think you're talking about Lieutenant General Saeed, the Air Force Inspector General. He's a, a three star uh, and um, he was selected by Secretary Kendall. Uh, the tasking went to Secretary Kendall uh, to um, uh, to choose an appropriate level three or four star, and the tasking memo to Secretary Kendall was three or four star. He chose Lieutenant General Said. I don't want to speak for Secretary Kendall, but I know that a, a, a part, a significant part of that decision was because of the independence of the IG and the ability for uh, the IG to follow up if he needed to. Um, and of course, you all saw his report, he came out and, and briefed you on it. Um, and so this is this decision today is very much in keeping with the Secretary's intent uh, on that one. Uh, he, you know, he has, in fact, in this case, chosen a specific four-star, General Garrett, um, and, uh, and has uh, and gotten support from Secretary of the Army Warmuth for his selection for this job. But um, in both cases, uh, very high-level uh, officers now uh, chosen to, to do these reviews. Uh, and it's a, re I re you know, a reflection of how seriously he's taken the issue, uh, that he wants to make sure that, that we do a proper review and inquiry of the original incident and the investigations that followed it. Uh, and if there are changes to procedures, authorities, if there's needed accountability that, uh, that he wanted a, a, an officer at that level, that senior level, uh, to be able to make those calls. And somebody that was not obviously directly involved in 
the incident itself, and then, so there's some distance there, so that um, so that there can be a dispassionate review of the information. Uh, yeah, Orrin. Um, is General Garrett's investigation a formal 15-6, or is any part of it a 15-6? And then why General Said had 45 days, General Garrett has 90. Was there a concern that General Said didn't have enough time, or is this supposed to be broader and deeper? Why twice as much no, time? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't read anything into the timeline, Orrin. I, I, the Secretary believed that this one happened a long time ago. I mean, more, more than two years ago. And I think the Secretary wanted to allow some more time to deal with the fact that the information is much older. Um, uh, and so we're in just in time and space, we're more distant uh, from it. And I'm sorry, and your other question was? Is it a 15-6? No, this is, a, we're calling it a review and an inquiry. So it's not an official 15-6 investigation. Now, what form that takes, obviously that'll be up to General Garrett. Christina. Thank you. Um, there's some, amid the rising tensions between two fronts, you're having the Indo-Pacific and then also the eastern flank of Europe. Uh, some people are suggesting that um, that there's, there are concerns about the industrial uh, defense industrial supply data, uh, base, that whether it would be able to support uh, conflicts over, especially if they were over multiple days, longer period of time, uh, especially intense conflicts in any one particular area or another. Do you have any comment about that? Well, obviously, we're not immune to the supply chain issues that the rest of the country, indeed the world, is, is experiencing right now. Um, but we also, as you well know, in military logistics, redundancy is everything. Uh, and so we're, we're factoring that into our planning as best we can. The secretary remains comfortable that we'll be able to defend the nation uh, as needed around the world. I haven't gotten anybody on the phone here. Uh, Jennifer Steinhauer, New York Times. Uh, hi, could you just clarify um, when Secretary Austin sent that letter to the governor of Oklahoma considering National Guard vaccines? And also, um, if they dig in, because you talked about what, what guardsmen choose to do or not do, but it's a, it's a state policy at this point, um, could they jeopardize their funding that they receive um, from the federal government that funds most of guards activities? So on the first uh, question, Jennifer, that, that letter was sent today, um, uh, about midday. Um, on your second question, again, I don't want to speculate about outcomes here. Really, this is uh, more, uh, the, the, uh, the consequences are really going to be more felt on an individual basis. As I was telling Bob, it's, it's an individual's um, ability to, to maintain service and participation in the National Guard that will be mostly affected. Uh, Miguel, I need, also, if you don't mind, I need to keep going on the phone here. I kind of let that go. Paul from Politico. Hi, John. Thanks for doing this. Um, getting back to Ukraine, uh, what what steps is the United States taking, or with you know, on its own or with NATO allies, to try to impress upon the Russians that um, you know maybe going into Ukraine would be a bad idea? And are we assisting the Ukrainians with logistics or anything like that, moving around uh, their own troops? We're obviously continuing to consult with allies and partners. Uh, Secretary Blinken is uh, on his way to Europe, uh, if not already there, and I know he'll be participating in a foreign ministerial uh, while he's over there. So we continue to talk and consult with allies and partners, um, and specifically with Ukrainian officials a as well. Um, and I, well, I can't speak to uh, options or decisions, you know, going forward. Uh, what I would remind is that, you know, we, we have um, and continue, this administration continues what has been uh, uh, a truly bipartisan effort uh, since 2014 to continue to provide security assistance items, both lethal and non-lethal, uh, to Ukraine. Um, and so I don't have anything to announce today. I mean, uh, this administration uh, remains committed uh, to helping uh, the Ukrainian military uh, defend itself, defend uh, its territorial integrity, defend it, it, its people. Yeah. John, do you have any update on the conflict in Ethiopia in terms of U.S. involvement? Uh, is there any information new that you can share with us about what's going on in Ethiopia? Yeah, yeah I, I don't have anything specific to, to speak to on what's happening, obviously, on the ground. We're watching it very closely. Um, uh, what I can tell you is that there are, uh, that there's, there's, no request for U.S. military assistance in any way right now. We don't envision um, any U.S. military intervention in this conflict. Uh, and again, we're watching it 
uh, obviously closely, and we're in close touch with our State Department colleagues. Okay, Court. On the Oklahoma Guard issue, if, if an individual is not vaccinated and is not allowed to train and drill, they don't get paid, right? That's, so, eventually, that, that could be the outcome, yes. So it's, so it's not withholding funding to the Guard, but That's one repercussion of not being vaccinated, just to be clear, is that individual is not getting their federal money. That is correct. That, that's what participation in the Guard would mean. And that's what I was saying in the previous question is really the, the repercussions, the consequences are largely going to, I, for those who continue to refuse, would be felt on an individual level. Thanks. I just want to be clear Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Iran, John, Iran continues to, uh, continues with its nuclear, of course, um, program. And then they are, uh, of course, close to a point where it is irrevocable. Uh, and at the same time, Tehran is asking all sanctions to be lifted before returning to the call. Has the secretary provided any options, any other options, military options to president with respect to Iran? I, I won't speak to specific uh, discussions that the secretary has with the commander in chief. Uh, our job is to provide uh, options, of course. And as Dr. Carlin uh, briefed a while ago, we have a very robust presence in the region as it is. Tens of thousands of troops uh, all over the region, as well as a very significant maritime presence in the Persian Gulf. That all will continue. Uh, so our job here is to make sure that that there are options available to the commander in chief if he needs them. That said, we continue to very much support the efforts of our State Department colleagues in uh, trying to get uh, a return to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the, the, the deal that was struck under the Obama administration with, with Iran. And as you know, those discussions are ongoing right now, and uh, we're very much in support of that. We believe that uh, diplomacy is the best path forward here. And as the Secretary has, has said many times, no problem in the Middle East gets easier to solve with a nuclear-armed Iran. So it's in our, it, obviously it's in our interest and the interest of our allies and partners uh, that, uh, that that outcome doesn't happen. Okay, just one more, and then uh, I think we can call it a day. Uh, Jeff Shogel. Uh, thank you. The Marines are expected to announce soon the number of Marines who are unvaccinated. At last count, it was something like 16,000. There are also roughly 40,000 soldiers who have not yet been vaccinated and about 8,000 airmen and guardians. Can the Defense Department afford to lose that many service members if, if all of them are separated? Well, Jeff, uh, we obviously don't want to see that be the outcome. Um, uh, and that's why the secretary continues to um, uh, to, to encourage everybody uh, active in reserve and in the Guard to get vaccinated. That's the best way to protect yourself, your family, your unit, your community. And uh, as he said many times, a, a vaccinated force is a more ready force. So we don't want to see anybody uh, not uh, take the vaccine, uh, except those obviously that, you know, medically are precluded from doing it or at their doctor's advice. And we're going to continue to we're going to continue to hammer home that message. Uh, the secretary met with all the service secretaries this morning as part of a normal monthly battle rhythm. And uh, and this issue of uh, vaccination was uh, on the agenda. The secretary reiterated that, uh, you know, that he, he wants them to keep that press up to get as many people vaccinated as possible. I know this is going to be hard to answer, but do you guys have any early indications that any service members may have the new variant? We don't at, at this time, Court, no. We don't have any indications that it is um, that it has manifested itself inside the military ranks, but we'll obviously watch that as closely as we can. Okay, thanks, everybody. Yeah, I'll be leaving.